Well, Jeremy, thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you and your background, um, and then we can dive into some some more kind of technical questions um, about uh, uh, sports performance and technology and all the above. Absolutely. How how far back would you uh, like me to go in the in the back? <laughs> Whatever feels right to you. I mean, I uh, did my undergraduate in sports medicine. Um, I enjoyed that route because it gives you a big deep dive of anatomy, physiology, obviously like common use of injuries and things of that nature. But after undergrad, uh, did grad school in X phys, wanted to get more of the uh, performance side of things. I uh, did that at the University of Texas. Um, there, I kind of parlayed that. I don't really have GA ships at Texas. So I kind of parlayed it into like a rehab coordinator role where I was using my ATC expertise within the weight room setting, kind of help with our, our long-term rehab guys. Um, and then from there, that kind of changed things. Obviously, we our head coach got fired. We ended up having to disband and kind of go do our own things. Spent three years in the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. Uh, I was an athletic trainer, a manual therapist, and then a strength coach. Um, the different years, different affiliates. Um, and then I took that. I wanted to get back into college athletics. Um, pro sports is great, but you don't really develop in pro sports. It's more of uh, you have the big money guys, and their expectations is just to be on the field as much as possible. So I want to get back into college, had to kind of start from the ground up, uh, took a job at Southern Utah University. It's an FCS school uh, mm -hmm. in Utah. Director there, ended up leaving for the Buffalo Bills, kind of left it in my hands. And I was lucky enough, I had a great head coach that believed in me at 26. And I actually got to run their program for two years as their director of football. And then um, that kind of springboarded me into meeting our old director here. Um, he brought me out to Florida. I'm a, I'm a desert boy. So when you bring a, a, a desert boy to Florida in the winter from Utah, um, it kind of made my decision a little bit easier, but that changed my transition from football back to baseball. Yep. And, and uh, ever since I've been here, I've been in charge of uh, baseball and volleyball. Awesome. Yeah. So you wore many hats throughout your career. That's, that's cool. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. Oh, my um, pleasure. So I guess like, I guess with that too. So, uh, I mean, you've been a variety of places. You've been in a variety of different sports, different leagues. Um, what kind of pieces of technology have you used? Um, and, and what do you kind of currently actively use also for sports performance and, and kind of why as well? Yeah, I mean, from technology, I mean, obviously, in my Dimebacks days, a lot of like goniometries, right? And, and, and yeah. working for angles and, and things of that nature. We did a lot of like a, a idea of ideology called PRI, postural restoration. And so they're big on understanding like limb length and, you know, discrepancies of the pelvis, and different things like that. So, you know, used a lot of that, but it wasn't more technology based. It was more, like I said, just using handheld goniometers and, and looking at, you know, straight leg raises and hip internal external rotation, obviously shoulder internal external rotation and then like overhead flexion um, were some of the big keys there. Um, trying to think obviously in southern utah we didn't have a ton of technology there much more of a smaller school so i've, I've been, I haven't been a lot of places where I, i've been fortunate enough um in the advancement of technology to kind of to kind of get there um when i got here we did a lot of like uh, on base u screenings uh so such as tpi and then that transferred into on base u and they created a kind of more of a baseball specific right and they had uh, the k best technology where, you know, we worked on um, like, you know, as far as thoracic and, and hip. And yeah. so, you know, instead of just using that little piece in the ground and saying, okay, that equals 45 or about 45 degrees of rotation, we actually had a K vest kind of showing us what that, that was. So we use a lot of that in our pre-screening of athletes. And then obviously, you know, four to six weeks later, you know, use that again for, for our screening on that nature. Uh, from there, I kind of obviously got into the velocity based world with push initially. Um, I wish we had force plates over here. I would dive more into push plates, uh, more into obviously like the valid uh, hamstring Nordics and, and stuff like that. I love all that kind of stuff. Again, work with what I got with where I am. Yep. So a lot of times now we just use a just jump map um, as well. And then obviously we, you know, now are, are fully perch operated here at baseball. And so from our general screening standpoints, uh, our trainer kind of does more of that nowadays. Uh, she's mm -hmm. a handheld dynamometer as well as just the general metrics of what on base U does and stuff like that. Um, and then we measure a lot of uh, big toe mobility, uh, ankle dorsiflexion, ankle, ankle plantar flexion, uh, where we've gotten more big onto, yes, we wanna see passive hip internal and external, but we also wanna see active hip internal and external because we could have a dude that has all the freedom in the world on the table and he gets up, he dumps the, hip, the pelvis forward and now we've changed our, our entire hip internal and external rotation. So. We've over the years expanded out of just table lying things 
to now doing actual on ground feet, you know, closed chain uh, exercise as well. And then again, you know, we're, we're testing everything from internal external rotation overhead. Uh, we have a whole device that'll give us a full 180 when they're going through range of motion, stuff like that. And then we'll actually work on like a two finger grip strength as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so a lot of that now we've kind of transitioned to like an arm care plus is the app in the system. So it's, um, I don't know how much you know about that. It's more of a baseball world deal, but yeah. it's literally a, a actual handheld dynamometer. And then the guys Bluetooth pair it with their phone and then they run through a series of isometric testing as well as, like I said, range of motion testing. Um, and so we'll do that. And then, like I said, for me, for the most part, a lot of that is taking a lot, a lot of that information and utilizing it as far as like our testing is considered. Yep. So I guess with that too, like where are you consolidating all the info and, and how are you using it to inform, uh, you know, changes in programming, uh, you know, different mobility drills, whatever it may be, um, even like the, some of the jump testing stuff, like how are you using that to inform performance, um, both in season and out of season? So we'll, obviously we'll, we'll start as far as that with out of season and, and obviously we get them in and then we test them before we even lift them or we do anything. Yeah. Uh, I'm more of like a new age guy when it comes to a warm up. I don't believe in like just the old school jumping jacks, you know, whatever it is, touch your toes, like get after it going. So what I'll actually do is I'll sit with our trainer and we'll kind of go over like our big things of, okay, like what did guys fail for the most part? It's like where at least like 60% of the team lack this, right? And so a lot of things obviously you see by nature is uh, ankle mobility is number one. Guys just have terrible, terrible feet these days. Um, obviously, we're always working hips and then thoracic rotation are usually like our big three things that that we see. So when I build our warm up from there, it, it's incorporating that. So we'll actually have like three blocks of a warm up. So our first block is soft tissue. So again, obviously being in the manual therapy world, like I still have my ATC, like a lot of ART and FDM certifications. So like that was the big deal with the Diamondbacks. They were like, you don't need machines to fix the body. You fix the body with your hands. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent in soft tissue. I think that gets overlooked into like flexibility and mobility. I think you have to clear the muscle, the capsule, the joint space before we can actually see how it works. So we do a whole bunch of soft tissue. So we're rolling out the bottom of our feet. Um, we're doing, we're rolling on foam rollers. We're getting lax balls in the pack. We're getting lax balls in the post shoulder. Um, that then from there we'll go into like our flexibility section. So banded lat stretches, banded ankle work, uh, big toe. So I'll take like a tennis ball and we'll do like first ray mobility, kind of off the tennis ball with their big toe. So if you're thinking about like trying to do essentially like a calf stretch, but instead of that, it's just the big toe is is on a, a tennis ball. And we're just kind of working that that uh, extension uh, yeah. on first ray mobility as well. And then from there, we go into like our mobility section. So it's a lot of like 90-90 work. It's a lot of thoracic spine work. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're doing like ankle drives, three different plane of motion ankle drives as well. Yep. And we get into like our kind of our activation phase. So obviously nowadays, especially in baseball, I think it's kind of spreading more, but obviously the pelvis is becoming a huge deal and learning how to like keep a stacked pelvis. Um, so keep a stable rib cage over a stacked pelvis and not yep. dip forward or dip backwards. So we'll see that 90% of our guys can't do that or they do like the shake and bake, we call it. So we're hammering supine. We go from supine to standing and things of that nature, right? Um, a big thing I've, div I've dove into this year, and it's not necessarily from screenings. I've just seen it more from what I've dove into on my own research is yep. we've had a lot of low back stuff in the past. And so we've just thought, you know, hammer the hip flexor, hammer the hip flexor in regards to flexibility, mobility. And this year I've been looking at strengthening the hip flexor. We're still doing our mobility work with it, but really doing like hip flexor lifts and building and strengthening the hip flexor. We've yeah. seen a lot of like low back stuff kind of disappear uh, from yeah. that stuff this year. And then of course, then we're getting kind of just baseball specific. So we're doing like cross body, internal, external rotation with the arms, trying to get disassociation going from upper and lower. They're called like an arm bar or different like exercise names or whatnot. Yep. So that's kind of like the, and then we finish with med balls and like a, a hop series and stuff like that, trying to find the body. And then we'll come in from there. Yeah. yeah. Are you incorporating any like pails or ales like FRC? You mentioned PRI. Are you incorporating some of that stuff as well uh, with these guys? So I, I found it. Uh, the problem, I, I, I love FRC. I'm FRC certified and like I find ways to incorporate it. But in regards to like their deep dive, like I appreciate like his thought process of like, you know, tightening everything, locking in, you know, we're starting very small movements. And, you know, as soon as you see like the QL fire to keep your hip up when you're trying to get into internal rotation, like, you know, it's big no nos and stuff. But being in a group in a big setting, I kind of just do general things. So we do like a lot of pro swimmers, right? at the rack itself in the workout uh, we pair lower body up with that so like we started with half kneel like single leg cars 
and then we went yep. to uh, standing rack assisted um, with the cars as well too. But you know, I've, I've thought about you know this spring um, kind of doing more on the whistle or more stuff like that mm -hmm. in regards to like the pails and rails. But at the end of the day too, I'm a big like, what are we gonna get bang for our buck? I only have a certain amount of hours and. If they're not gonna buy into to the de the depthness of it, then I'd rather try to program things into it that I can, you know, somewhat get what I want out of them, but you know, not lose the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I mean, within the workout itself, again, with my space, we only have four racks. So when I get, you know, anywhere from twelve to sixteen guys in, there's always a guy left out because you have a guy working, a guy spotting, and then there's somebody else. So we're either gonna get core engagement in. Or we're going to get some type of thoracic or hip flexor, you know, hip mobility work in under the side like that. So it's a combination of 90-90 work. It's a combination of cars. Or we're just doing a lot of thoracic spine, whether it's one-legged, it's, you know, a half knee with a foam roller. or kind of those windmills around the world type of situations we're doing. So kind of find more generalized stuff than getting as specific as, as some of the FRC drills are, if that makes yep. sense. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Yeah, it's definitely bang for the buck. I understand that. It's a it's a tough thing to coach intent on too for in a in a group setting, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. And I mean with football, you, you get a little bit more buy-in because again, like kind of that strength coach and, and athlete role is, is much more of, of that, you know, authoritative figure. Mm -hmm. Baseball is a funny sport where you know it's growing into being a weight room sport, right? But for a while it hasn't. And a lot of times I'll get kids that have no experience in a weight room, you know. So again, building that culture and that idea in them, you know, sometimes is, is a little bit harder if I'm pushing like, you know, an FRC ankle car, right? I have a lot of kids that'll just sit there, hold their knee and, and go in circles, right? Versus actually trying to create mobility where, you know, if I put a stick in front of them, I, I put a band around them and a kettlebell on top and we're driving, you know, forward, inside and outside with that. That's, you know, helping, you know, at least gain mobility in the different planes and trying to feel that tripod versus having guys pick their feet in the air and, and go in, you know, circles and, and whether they're getting something out of it or not, I won't know until we retest. Right. 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 Yeah. None of that makes sense. Um, talk to me a little bit more about, uh, I mean, you you started using perch not that long ago, um, just about player development with, you know, velocity based training and then everything else we enable as well from evaluation to, um, you know, beyond as well. Um, just using it uh, out, season, out, out of season, in season, um, player development, athletic development, all the above. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I've definitely made my mistakes with, with velocity base too when I've been trying stuff out. And so, you know, when I got really deep into it, I threw the freshman on too soon. And again, guys started caring more about numbers than they did about form and about how the quality of movement's happening. And again, especially trying to teach how to be strong with a stacked pelvis. Like, you know, we were, we were losing a lot of that. And so what I've kind of really learned now is my older guys, they get right back on to velocity and we start rolling from there because a lot of those guys, that max strength bucket's been filled for them. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our younger guys, now again, I'm a, a, I'm a merit-based guy where, you know, we had a, a football kid come in uh, two years ago and he graduated out of my freshman development phase by the time summer was over, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. I'll pick and choose and move them as they are. But yep. most of the freshmen, I take them pretty much almost through the, end of fall, like the last phase of fall, I now introduce them to the, the velocity based, um, you get them under perch, you get them working. Um, my older guys, they start from the very ground of, of that, because again, to me, it's not necessarily about how much weight can we drive anymore? It's how much stronger can we get while driving in specific speeds and specific zones, depending on yeah. where we're at. And that's been huge for us. Again, like I feel like a lot of our injuries are a lot of like over fatigue stuff or pushing guys too hard in the weight room has been great being able to, again, you know, monitor and understand that. And that kind of the monitoring and stuff is more of my, my in season, you know, as far as that, that development you're talking about in the off season, again, you know, I run a, a, a wave, a velocity wave in essence, uh, got the idea from Blaine Kinsley. Um, so instead of just trying to pick like specific zones and say, Hey, we're going to work in speed strength this day. We're going to work in strength speed, you know, in these blocks, these phases, I'm more so like ride a curve. So we'll go week one is 0.8, week two is 0.7, week three is 0.6, and week four is 0.5. And now I know like that's kind of the top end of true max strength, right? Like kind of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 is there. But again, being it's baseball, being a lot of it's that front squat position, that front rack, again, just being conscious of all that. And then again, the, the desire for speed in the game. I don't really go below 0 0.5. I kind of use 0 0.5 as my, my maxing in essence of, of that phase. And then from there, We'll finish where we add a 0.5 and then we'll ride the wave again. So we're going back up to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. And to me, guys kind of open their eyes because they never have max tested right. An example I can give you is I had a kid and he was doing 
215 on our uh, front rack reverse lunges in his 0.8 period. And then when we went back around to the wave, he was hitting 275 now at 0.8. And so explain it to that guy of like, look how much more weight we're moving at the same speed gives the guys the realization of like, oh my gosh, like I've actually, my max has gone up significantly without ever having to be in a max strength phase or, or understanding that. So to me, that, that's been a great help to our, especially our older guys that, that kind of, how do you continue to not run the plateau and continue to build them up? I think that's really been a, a huge thing for us here as far as that player development. And then especially the younger guys too, again, I slow them down. I take them through strength. I take them through max strength, but then we kind of hit that powerish phase and then I throw them on there. It's a whole nother world again now of like, Oh my gosh, like that's how fast point eight is right. Like that, that's a whole nother. It's it. And again, it creates the excitement, not only from a neural drive, but obviously a weight room drive as well too. So uh, it's been great. And it's something that's not physiologically related, but, but all from the perch system is we run the live leaderboard, right? And again, we talk about trying to get effort out of guys when you only see them so often. You have a live leaderboard up and guys come in and they see that last group and they're like, oh, there's no way he did 0.9 to 225 today. Like, no. And then that now becomes the challenge or the concept, right? So yeah. as far as helping build intent and, and creating to make sure that every guy's rep matters, you know, that that live leaderboard is, has been a, a great feature for us this year. Now, are you kind of sort of uh, tracking like load velocity profile type stuff with that kind of progression over the duration of like the four weeks where you're going 0.8 all the way down to 0.5? Like, are you are you monitoring that uh, on the actual web app and then um, translating that into, you know, uh, uh, predictive uh, 1RMs or, or anything that, you know, you anticipate they will be able to lift that 0.8 in that next uh, phase? Or, or how are you kind of using the data um, to encourage athletes and, and track them over time? So I actually need to get better at that as far as the off season stuff for me in season again, because it's such a, a monitoring tool for myself. I, I kind of yeah. look more at those, those um, just again, how they're trending and, and kind of where they're at and what I'm asking them to do. Right. There's also too I run into athletes of them not understanding of like, Hey man, like if I want to be in the 0.7 range and your first two sets, you're in the 0.8. It's like, that's not where we're at for the day. And so then we have to load them, you know, the way they want to load them and stuff. So I'm still kind of like working through that, especially this is our first year with like all the racks have perched. Last yeah. year, I just got it in season and we just had one rack that we we're kind of demoing it right. So again, this year has kind of been trying to learn all the ins and outs now that all my athletes are, are on the system and I'm getting all that feedback. So that's definitely an area as far as this off season that I've got to get better at as far as like being able to pull that data and start being able to predict certain things with our guys. Yeah. For me, it's, it's really been, I see their numbers, I see where it is and then I have a general idea, but I like them to kind of like open their own eyes and be like, Oh, like, yeah, like I did 215 last time I was at point eight and they hit it on and it's like a 1.0 and it's kind of again, a, 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 an athlete instant feedback is one of the best things I could say about velocity based stuff too. Not just perch in general, but all that of an athlete visually seeing, Oh my gosh, like I'm moving a 1.0 with this weight. Like, and then that kind of, again, you know, we're, we're pumping them up, we're getting them there. And, and so I've been doing more of that kind of blend of a little bit of that old school with, with the new technology, but you know, definitely, especially going into season this year, now that all my racks are there and stuff, I'm really going to be able to kind of help pick the loads and, and monitor guys and, and see more trends from a general standpoint. Yep. Yeah, no doubt. Um, tell me a little bit more about kind of your methodology when it comes to, I guess, weight room technology as a whole, but also velocity-based training specifically. You started mentioning kind of buckets and you know, various adaptations at different speeds. Um, and I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. I mean, like I, just like any old school kind of football guy, well, cause I came from, you know, Texas football. And like I said, even, you know, at Southern Utah and football, right. You know, you're just driven by strength, right? Like that, that's the key. Like we need to get guys strong. We need to get guys strong. And then, you know, a lot of that, especially with our speed and skill guys, we're taking them out. We're doing a ton of running. We're doing a ton of this. Right. And so for me, this has been the, the biggest eye opening of like, I, now I can't recreate sprinting, right? That, that, that's, that's, you know, something that is done outside, but at the end of the day, now in the weight room, like I can get somewhat of a neurological firing from these guys from that instant feedback. So, you know, I didn't really understand in the stage of football of like, I was just always like, Hey man, the overload theory is going to work. Like this is what we're going to do to drive it. Like I said, now that I have higher level athletes and we're in a sport where, you know, we can't keep loading the bar at a certain weight, right? Like that's just not going to be beneficial to our athletes. You know, this has really opened up my eyes into saying like, again, like I said, how do I avoid plateaus, right? Like how do I continue to get guys to chase new things? And a lot of that is 
putting them in different zones and different speeds and, and, and kind of pressing them to do that. So to me, like I said, you know, most people want, especially my younger guys, once I see, all right, we're basically at a two rep and you failed on your second rep. So it's really a one rep max. And we see how slow they're moving. And then I see that over a few weeks. I know, okay, like that's where we've gotten this guy. This is where it is. Now, like I said, for me, it's time to start using velocity base. Like I want to make sure again, you know, we're, we're bilaterally strong. We're unilaterally strong. We understand how to produce force, how the ground force productions work. And then we start to, like I said, fill the strength bucket, fill that. Cause I mean, there's even some guys that we haven't talked about that, that are weight, right? Like I've got to get them bigger. Right. So we're spending a lot of time in a, in a hypertrophy phase. And you know, there's many ways to skin the cat in that of, you know, whether it's just time under tension to failure, right. Or we're going high volume, you know, there's different ways of, of skinning that cat in that regard. But to me, you know, I, I may not even bring in velocity base until their size is what the size the coach wants. Right. And then once we've got the size there, now we have more cross-sectional area. Now, how can we, you know, start to, again, now to climb that next bucket or that next ladder. Right. So, you know, depending on the way guys come in, what coaches want for me, those are the kind of, like I said, the buckets that I'll put them in. And then from there, it's like, what are their needs? What have we filled? And now what are we needing to, to now fill or now pour over into the, into the next phase to, again, make sure we don't plateau and make sure we continue to see whatever the gains are we want to see from an athlete. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Uh, I got one last one for you. So uh, we're releasing Perch Evaluate, um, which is essentially jump assessments. So counter movement jump, um, uh, arm swing, arms fixed, uh, continuous jumps, et cetera. Uh, that's assessments essentially that's going to get be able to get done directly at the weight rack. Talk to me a little bit about the value of um, a, a tool like Perch for kind of continuous evaluations through training, um, you know, based on on loads lifted at various velocities, um, and then something like this where it's like an at rack kind of assessment type of tool, um, where you kind of see the application for something like that versus like a jump mat um, or, or you know something kind of similar, um, even like a vert vertex, et cetera. Um, where where do you kind of see the application of that fitting in into your overall program? Well, for me personally, we we use the vertical uh, jump, especially like the jump. And again, not people like look at me like you know volleyball is more the vertical sport. Why why baseball? Why you have them? And it's the same thing that goes back to force plates and jumping. At the end of the day, like I'm trying to create counter movement. I'm trying to get them to to become more of that quick twitch, right? And and use ground force productions and and get up there. So in the off season for us, a lot of that jump mat stuff isn't necessarily monitoring, right? It's continuation of like teaching guys how, how to quick move, how to counter move, how to produce force at a quick amount of time. And, you know, a lot of kids come in and I'm not going to take credit for it because I believe just like sprinting, like they could have jumped at 33 when they walked in, they just didn't know how to jump at 33. So, you know, again, they climb from a 28 to a 30 to and then eventually getting to a 33. But for me, like a lot of the value, I especially see it in season is we're collecting data, me and my trainer all off season of like, what's their mean, right? What's, what's their, what's their highest one they have. And then we've kind of, there is no real study out there. So we've kind of done our own testing. We have like right around like a 90 to 92% cutoff, right? And so we give them three different opportunities to jump. And then again, if they they fail or they're below that threshold, two of the three, then again, to us, that's kind of like a little red flag of the day of like, okay, what, how their central nervous system firing? Like, let's take a look at their weight. Let's take a look at this. And then if it's a pitcher, what are we asking them to do bullpen wise or a position player? What's expect them in the field? And I think like, well, one is we know that, that a jump mat isn't as accurate as we'd like it to be. You know, my guys can start to figure out little ways to kind of cheat the system or this or that. So I think, you know, like the value of perch is, you know, again, how accurate can I be? A camera system monitoring and watching and making sure, again, like the movement's accurate, it's valid, it's it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I think it's going to be huge for, for us in that regard. And then again, I mean, the easier it is, the better. You should see, like, I'll have a line, right, because we have one jump mat. And so guys will finish whatever their explosive movement is and they'll do a jump map before they go outside and do a multi-planar jump. And, you know, we'll have a line of like 14 guys, you know, just kind of waiting to jump and kind of go in there. And so, again, we talk about efficiency and, and how to make things smooth. That's, you know, one of the could be one of the best things for us, especially in season when I don't have a ton of time to lift. And it's a lot of like hey, get good quality stuff in and get out. If guys are at the rack and they can start hitting their jumps at the rack and, you know, we can knock out, you know, three guys at a rack while all three guys are going and 12 guys are done much quicker. Again, from an efficiency standpoint, that's there. And then again, to me, the accuracy and then being able to save the data because we're, you know, just handwriting on sheets, you know, like I have my intern sit there, finds the last name, writes down on sheets, and then our trainer will go and input that into the system. 
Now, if we have the ability to pull it off, you know, purchase dashboard and we have all this going for us, or even if Perch is able to, you know, on their back end, come up with stuff like that in that regard of like saying, um, hey, we're able to track all of these guys' jumps and can red flag stuff or can monitor the way, you know, we talked about the different uh, zones being in and tracking their force velocity profile. You know, that's something that, that we can help track as well and give us more data on outside of just getting a vertical jump number. You know, I, I do run with our pitchers the pre day beforehand, some type of like an RSI to a degree. Um, it's kind of like more of a, a four count trap our jump. But again, we're looking at time spent on the mat as well as, you know, velocity in the air and stuff of that nature. Uh, but again, if that's something that, Perch can do again, you know, I'm, I'm all about the, the more validity we can get and the, the better we can recreate things consistently over and over again, then the better it is for us kind of going forward. So um, I would be more excited to be able to efficiently knock out guys and consistently and then also have a cloud for us to automatically be transferring our data over instead of, you know, me at the end of the day, taking a sheet from the intern and, and having to go that route. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, definitely more efficient kind of all around. Lastly, just a quick kind of like practical application question here for you. Um, when you uh, are flagging guys, so like if you're putting them in kind of like the stoplight buckets of like green, you're good to go, like yellow, maybe we'll watch it, red, no, not so much. Um, how are you adapting training or is that pretty variable based on the guy and based on the time of year? It's a little bit of both. Um, I'll give you an example of in season. Like it's um, so again, by that point in season, I have a, a generalization of what their max is all right. And so I'm big on programming warm up sets. Because again, too, like, so we have different days in season. I, I kind of take something of like a, a West Side barbell as far as like we have a maximum effort day and then a dynamic effort day. And so like the, the end of the week or the end, beginning of the week, the end of our weekend, that's our maximum day when we have an off day. Like it's about like pushing the heavy weight. And obviously we have a dynamic day getting closer to game time, you know, at the end of the week. But for our maximum effort day, for me, it's really big on programming the warm up sets because we're only doing like three by two, three by one of like our true, like, you know, 85, 90, like what our, our maximum effort is that day. So uh, for me in those warm up sets, I'm big on, I should know how 135 moves. I should know how 185 moves these guys. And I kind of have ideas. Okay. These are the speeds that I know they move at. And as soon as I see that, whether it's up or down, it's going to change everything off that because, you know, a lot of studies will say, you know, your one RM can fluctuate, right? 10 to 18% on a given day. And so I won't get too technical on like figuring out, okay, what percentage are we out of the day? It's mm -hmm. more so saying, okay, like, Hey, you usually come in and you usually pump 135 out at a 1.0 with no problem today. You're moving it to 0.8. So now we're going to see how 185 moves. And then from there, we're going to see how 225 moves. And we may operate just on 225 if that's the zone we're in. Right. Because, you know, I want them to be, you know, whether it's 0.6 or 0.5 or whatever I have for that given week, <laughs> I want them to be able to operate at, at that day, what is their 0.6, what is their 0.5, given off what like their internal max is for the day. You know, we'll either, like I said, change the percentage then of what we're operating off of. And then again, I'm gonna cut a lot of the back end work. We don't have a ton of back end work, but again, you know, basing off of how we finish those sets, if we have three sets of two at 225 and you know, he crushes set one, set two starting to slow a little bit down, and then set three, we're kind of falling out of that range, right? Then I know I'm going to cut a lot of that back end work because we're still just not being at, this, at the firing that I want them to be at. On the flip side, if, you know, they're staying at 225 and they're able to do that, it's like, okay, hey, we know which where we're at for the day. and We may keep them that back end volume similar, right? So, you know, again, it, to me, it's more of how are they starting and how are they ending when it comes to that big, heavy movement that I'm tracking for the day. And then again, too, there's always a flip side, right? A guy comes in and he's flying that day. He got great sleep, great rest, whatever the case may be. Then I'm going to push him and maximize those days as well, too, right? So we'll change that to the flip side and say, hey, man, we were supposed to operate at 225 at 0.6 today, but your, you know, 225 was 0.7. You know, let's go 235. Let's go 245. You know, we'll try to maximize those those days as well, too. So I'll work on both ends of the spectrum with what Perch is showing me. It's kind of based off of, again, like what, what I'm getting that feedback from. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, you got it. It's a great tool to take advantage of, of good training days uh, and uh, dial back when you need to as well. Absolutely, because, you know, guys, especially nowadays, they'll look at their whoop, they'll be in the red, or they'll come in this, and they'll get a couple warm-up sets in, and all of a sudden, like, whoa, like, I'm moving great, I'm feeling good. It's like, yeah, like, this is kind of kind of how we test things, kind of do it. And like I said, I'm, I'm still a little bit of an old-school guy. And I love all this tech, and you can see, like, I want a corporator do it, but, like, I still make them come in, and, like, they have to, like, write down, like, they have a hard copy, they still have to write down all their weights in their hard copy. Come on, Luke. Uh, they still have to do all that because, again, to me, interactions with the guys and 
getting to talk to them and, and, and see their feedback, you know, again, that's a huge, you know, another sense that I can get to try to monitor and do that. But then at the end of the day, the perch is going to tell me truly how they're firing and how they're moving and you can't BS uh, uh, your camera system. So yeah, 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 no, no doubt, no doubt. It's a tool in the toolbox. That's for sure. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, thank you again for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Again, anything I could do, you guys would be great for me. Bailey crushes it for me. So anything I could do to, to help the Perch team out in any way or form, just let me know.